Hello, um, welcome to Results in 30. This is an exclusive live stream event with layout artist Jen Mackey. My name is Sarah Von Fersen. I'm the mentorship and industry relations lead for the 3D animation and visual effects program here at Vancouver Film School, one of three distinct animation programs we offer here. One of my roles is to bring in current industry professionals and pair them with students matched on their career goals and their individual projects. And it's through this that I've been fortunate enough to work with Jen for the second time in my career, as Jen is currently our layout uh, mentor for our 3D program. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Um, so Jen's career has spanned over 10 years. She's worked at some big-name studios, including Sony and Pixar Canada. And she's also uh, won a Leo Award for editing a, a short project that she created with her husband. So um, it was at Pixar Canada where Jen and I first worked together a few years back. Jen was the layout lead and I was the character and sets lead. So we were used to working together quite a lot yes. in that capacity. Um, so I would now like to um, move over and say we're incredibly pleased to uh, welcome Jen here to talk about her career and say it's an important part of this event is to help students in high schools understand current industry trends and what's happening right now in our industries. And we're pleased to have an exclusive audience with Sisla High School, uh, the amazing Sisla High School in North Manitoba, that have some amazing things happening in interactive digital media. Uh, how is Sisla today? Great. Yay. <laughs> cool. We'd also like to say a big thank you to Jamie Leduc at Sisla sharing this talk with other Manitoba schools that include Swan Valley Regional Secondary School, Luxton School, Isaac Rock School, Kildonan East Collegiate, St. John's High School, and a shout out also goes to Osgoode Township High School, tuning in from Ottawa, South Carlton Secondary School, Canada School in New Zealand, and Capital High School in Olympia, Washington. Apologies if I butchered the pronunciation of any of those names. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jen Mackey, who's going to give an amazing presentation on layout and cinematography. Jen, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, hello to all the schools out there. Hello to Sisler and everybody else tuning in. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, so, as Sarah said, my name's uh, Jen Mackey. Um, I am a 3D layout artist, which I'll talk about later if you don't know what that is. I'm also an editor and as I said, I'm a mentor at the Vancouver Film School. Um, I would summarise what I do as basically uh, storytelling. Uh, and I'll get into that again in a little bit. But I mainly consider myself a storyteller. Um, so during this, this talk, I want, I want to cover a few things. Uh, firstly, how I got into animation. Um, and then also what a layout artist actually is, because it's not a too common a, a, a career path, so it's, it might seem a little obscure, so I'll try and explain that. Um, and then a few tricks of the trade about um, what, when you're watching a feature animation film, what, what things that they're doing to make you feel a certain way or, or to travel you through the story. Um, and then we're going to end with a question and answer. We're going to do 15 minutes with Sisler, um, and then we're going to open it up a wider audience with the online questions and see they'll help me out with that okay so as many of you probably also did uh, i grew up in animation i watched a lot of animations as a kid do you know cartoons i was obsessed with Wallace and gromit um as most kids are they love cartoons i never really thought much of it <laughs> um or certainly that it could be something that i could do um and when i was eight uh, my dad bought this really high-tech uh, video camera and um, I thought, hey, I could try and make my own animations. And I got my trolls at the time and started doing little stop motions. Unfortunately, I don't have any of those videos anymore. <laughs> I would love to show you them. They were not very good. Um, but that was my first kind of taste of like, oh, this is like a fun, creative thing that I could do. Um, I never considered it could be a career. Like, I don't think anybody ever mentioned to me, hey, you could do this, you know, you really love animation, you really love cartoons, that could be a career. That was never something I considered. It was only many years later that that was something that I 
decided to go into. One thing I did know um, was that I wanted to go to art school. Um, my dad was an artist, he'd gone to art school. Um, and it's always a, tr when you're in high school, it's a very hard time to kind of decide what am I going to do when I leave school. Um, and I wasn't sure, I just knew that art school, I wanted to be creative, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, so I applied to Glasgow School of Art. Um, I'm from Glasgow, from Scotland. Um, at first I applied to painting, again, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I didn't get in the first time. Um, I then went on to do another year to, to learn skills and, and how to approach the art school and how to get in. Um, I applied to sculpture and I got into sculpture that time. Um, but then actually I changed my mind again. <laughs> It's an ongoing theme. <laughs> and I ended up in fine art photography. Um, so then I, I went to Glasgow School of Art and did an honours degree uh, in fine art photography, which was four years. Um, so a long time. Um, and I learned a lot, a lot while I was there. I loved the course. Um, learned many, many skills. But when I came out of uh, my degree, I kind of thought, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure I want to be an artist. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I uh, want to go down the photography route. Um, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So, again, four years later, still not knowing <laughs> what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought about what I'd learned from those four years. Um, first of all, I learned that I loved photography. That was like, you know, I didn't stick out the four years hating it. I absolutely loved, loved what I was doing. I loved the process. Um, I also learned that I love working with computers. I did a lot of digital photography. Um, I loved the, the technical aspect. I enjoyed making films. We did a, a course during the photography degree um, solely based on making films. Um, and that was something I really, really like enjoyed and, and uh, savoured while, while I was there. Um, and when I considered everything together, I thought, the thing that I really liked about it was telling stories. Telling stories through uh, photography, but then also film as well. So I had to think, and I actually found a, a master's in animation actually at the same school, um, and thought, you know what, this kind of ties everything together. Like I enjoy, had enjoyed telling those stories. It was to do with computers. I thought that was something I could really enjoy. So I went back to school for another two years. Um, so yeah, back at Glasgow School of Art again, um, and then I started my master's in animation. Um, it was again two years of learning tools and techniques and storytelling, and at the end of it, this, these are stills from my um, final project. It's the same as at, at Vancouver Film School. You, you, we pro each student produced a, a final, a final animation at the end. So when I came out of um, my master's, it was scary time. I was like, okay, I need to now somehow get a job. Um, <coughs> so I basically started harassing companies <laughs> and trying to get my foot in the door. Um, so my first job was um, for a company called Axis Animation in Glasgow. Um, it was for, they were advertising for a layout artist and I didn't really know what that was, and I just thought, you know what, I'll just apply anyway, um, and somehow got the job. Um, it was a very, it was a great time to be there. I learned a lot while I was there. Um, again, it was it was my first job, so I was pretty intimidated by them. Um, but everybody, you know, took you on as a junior and explained all the terms that they were using that I didn't understand what they were talking about. Um, and that I really learned a lot while I was there. So I'll take you quickly through what studios I went to next. Um, so I decided to move to Canada, uh, kind of on a whim, fancy doing some traveling. Um, and my second job was at um, Stars Animation in Toronto. Um, they were advertising for a layout artist, and I thought, you know what, apparently that's what I was doing at the old job although I still didn't really know what it was. <laughs> so I applied um, and 
apparently they thought I could do it too. <laughs> Again, still not really understanding what it was. Um, but at that job, I really learned the skills that I needed to, to kind of move forward in my career. So that was it was a great experience. It kind of kind of lucked out a little bit, um, but again, it was just perseverance of, of putting yourself out there and, and applying to companies. Um, quickly, I went back to anim Axis Animation in Glasgow after that, like a year later. Uh, this year, having a lot more skills than I did the first time, um, and really helped them set up their layout um, process and pipeline. Uh, and then I went to Australia, <laughs> moved about a lot, um, where I worked on Happy Feet at Dr. D Animation, um, uh, which was slightly different. Again, it was um, working with motion capture, which is when you see the people with the suits with all the balls on them. Um, so it was, it was working in, it was still layout, but it was working in a different kind of form. So after that, um, oh, sorry, gone too far. Um, I um, started working at Pixar Canada in Vancouver. So this position was not an easy one to get into <laughs> by any means. Uh, even with experience, I applied, I think I applied three times. The first two times I didn't even get an interview. Uh, but I kind of, you know, it was obviously Pixar was somewhere I really wanted to work and I just kept applying and the third time the fit was right um, for what they were looking for and I got an interview, got several <laughs> interview after interview after interview and got the, the position. So I um, started at Pixar Canada. I uh, was there for three years and that's really where I kind of fell in love with the idea of story. I, you know, obviously been telling stories at um, previous positions um, but Pixar really put a huge emphasis on storytelling and that's really where I I fell in love with it. Um, yeah, so after that, sadly, the studio closed um, and then I moved to Montreal um, and worked at Micros and worked on The Little Prince, uh, which is a feature film, it's on Netflix if anybody fancies seeing it. Um, and then moved back to Vancouver and started work at Sony. Um, again, on Hotel Transylvania and Angry Birds. So now I actually work freelance. So um, I'm not working in a in a stu in a particular studio. I'm working on various projects, um, smaller projects, com more commercial projects, doing some editing, and it's also allowed me to be able to teach more at Vancouver Film School as well. So that's a brief history of my career so far. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what a layout artist is. Um, sometimes you might hear it being called a previs artist, it depends on the studio and the project, but I'll be referring to it as a layout artist. Um, so the easiest way to explain it, particularly to, to, um, to people who aren't used to thinking about the 3D pipeline, I know Sisler are pretty good with animation, so they might understand this more, <laughs> but uh, I'll just talk about it um, in terms of live action and animation. So if we think about a director in live action, it's exactly the same as an animation. It's the person that comes up, well, who, who leads the project from start to finish is their vision. It's exactly the same. Writer, again, person comes up with the story, uh, script, exactly the same in animation. The way that it starts getting different is um, once we get into set, a set designer. So somebody on a live action film who physically builds the set, they design the set, what's going to look like, what buildings do we need, what furniture do we need, what everything about the set, the set designer or set team. Um, within animation, that's obviously a modeler. So the modeling team, which is what Sarah uh, was, uh, was the lead lead of at Pixar Canada, it designs the, the sets in 3D. They build the sets, um, they create the whole world. So actors in live action, um, that's the equivalent of our animators. So the animators, the actors are the ones that sh show the emotion, show the action, show the emotion, tell the story. So that would be the equivalent of an animator. An animator does the exact same. The animator uh, 
shows the emotion of the character, leads the audience of how, how that character's feeling. Uh, special effects and stunts. Um, so somebody in a live action film will blow, blow up a car sometimes, or a building, or whatever. Within animation visual effects, it's the visual effects artist that does that. So when we think about a camera operator or a director of photography in live action, the person who's actually physically filming the, the scene. So somebody with the camera is deciding where the camera is going to go. Okay, we're going to film this shot with these people walking across. That, the equivalent of that in, in animation and uh, visual effects is a layout artist. That's basically what we, what we do. We're the camera people in the computer is the easiest way of um, describing it. Hopefully that helps. Um, so I'm just going to show briefly a, a CG pipeline. Um, don't be scared by this. It's a little, it's not, it's a little complicated. Um, but just to give a brief kind of overview of where, where layout lies, it lies really at the start of the pipeline. So once we have storyboards and an animatic, um, that's when layout takes, takes the, 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 the film into production. Um, it's before animation, it's before lighting, it's before effects. It's really an early on uh, process. So, um, <coughs> briefly, like a, a director and a writer will, will come along and say, you know what, I've got a story I want to tell. Here's the script, I've worked with a writer, Here's this is what I want to do. And then a storyboard artist will take that script and be like, okay, we need to work out... Um, the story in basic drawings, roughly what shots are going to be there, um, how, how are we roughly going to tell this story, what characters are we going to see. Um, sometimes we do get uh, storyboards that are as basic as this, but it still tells the story. Um, then the layout artist will take those storyboards um, and they'll really think about, okay, from these storyboards we've got a rough, rough idea of what's happening. What cameras should we use? So we're in the computer. We're not on 2D drawings anymore. We're, we're in the computer. We're with rough sets. We're what we have like rough characters. We're placing them in the scene. Um, we're, we're, we're working out shot to shot what's going to happen, what action are the characters going to walk across a certain distance, are the characters going to turn and talk to each other. Um, we work out timing, how that's all going to play out. And we're really thinking about how, how are we going to tell this story? This is like the building block of everything that's going to come after. So this is just a still from um, The Little Prince. Um, so this frame is a layout frame. So it's not pretty. It doesn't have like nice lighting or anything. It's got very basic models in there. But we, the, um, in this shot, I, uh, I worked on this even. So in this shot, you know, I was working out What's the framing going to be? Where's the camera going to be? Um, where the characters are going to be? Is it going to work how high they are, how tall the mum is, how small the little girl is? I worked out roughly what action's going to take place, what timing's going to take place in this shot. Um, and that all, t that all takes time. It, it looks rough, but that is an important step to move forward. So once we've composed this shot, it's passed on to animation and into lighting and to the uh, visual effects. Um, and at that point, they're like, you know what, this is great. The story's worked out. The cameras are worked out. All, all these details are, are worked out before it even gets to them. So they can concentrate on doing their job really well. So they can really concentrate on um, like the performance of the characters, the lighting, the modeling and texturing. Um, to really make that final film look amazing. Uh, they don't need to be concerned about, oh, does this shot work with the previous shot? Does it work with the shot after? They know that layout has already done that. Um, so this is a final frame. So it's very similar composition. The, the, the composition's not changed. The action was kind of the same, but we have lovely modeling, lighting, everything looks, looks really good. So. That's how we go from the layout to the final film. So um, it's never just about one shot, and that's 
really important within layout. Um, an animator will work on one or two shots in sequence. Effects lighting will always uh, uh, will always be working on single shots. But layout is really about a, a whole story, a whole sequence. So we're never just thinking about that one shot. We're thinking about the whole sequence. Uh, every shot that comes before, every shot that comes after. Um, how do they play into one another? Is the audience able to follow the action that's happening? Um, do Is there a shot that feels out of place? Is something jumping from shot to shot? It's really all about like how all those shots work together. Um, a little checklist that I always make for myself um, is... What is the purpose of each shot? What piece of information am I finding out in that shot? It might be as simple as uh, we're showing a new environment. So to be able to understand the story that's coming, we need to show this environment to the audience. It could be as simple as that, or it could be a, uh, a little action, or we need to see that the character's sad, so we have to have a, a moment on their face. Um, if there's a new piece of information being shown within the scene, a new character, that kind of thing, um, that's also something that's important to show. Um, also, I think about, okay, within this shot that we're, we have, are we trying to show an emotion or a feeling? Are we shooting it in the right way? So, if a, again, if a character's sad and we are really far away from them, or they're having some kind of emotional moment and we're really far away with them, that's not the best way to tell, that might not be the best way to tell um, the story in that shot because we feel more connected when the camera's close. Um, so it's always thinking about, am, am I putting the camera in the right place uh, to tell the story? Um, and does this uh, the shot enhance the story? Is it moving the story along? Um, because if it's not, it might not be important and you might be able to remove that shot. So I want to show you briefly um, just a couple of examples of what layout looks like in, in, a, in a film. that I'm going to use two examples, um, which is Party Saws Rex and RS500 and a half, both Pixar Canada. Um, so it's going to look a little bit like this. The layout is on the, the left side of the screen, the kind of rougher, bigger one. And then the final's on the right. If you just pay pay mainly attention to the left hand side at the layout um, and then look at how oh okay what they did in the layout is what the final film became um, I'm going to talk over it a little bit just th there'll be audio but I'll talk over a little bit just to point some, some things out um, okay so we'll just play this through okay so we're working out composition we're putting in temp effects here the rough animation. Obviously the animators do a much better job at the end than we do, but it gives them the cues to what they might need to add. We're looking at how the, each camera hooks up to one another. Again, timing. We're working out what characters we need. How many characters we, <laughs> we need you know, do we need 50 in that bowl or do we need 10? It's helping out all the other departments. Putting in temp effects again for the foam here. That was like, we worked all that out in layout so that the effects department could concentrate on making the foam look great opposed to working out where it was meant to be. Working out lighting as well in this one. And timing effects. Very rough animation. This is RS500. It's the same, different style. We're working out, okay, we're dealing with bigger cars here. We have to shoot them a different way. Working out, obviously, large camera moves like that. Working out very big camera moves like this, which is really helpful for modelling, so that they know how much of this environment we're going to see 
you don't want to spend time modeling something that they don't need in the film. Again, new environments. We're working out, okay, how, far, how fast do these cars need to drive? How, how much of a runway do we need? Adding in like foreground elements, temp effects again. Timing for effects as well. And then some basic posing just at the end here. Obviously the animators did a much better job, but we just put those things in to, to be able to tell the story. So just to, to go through some stills here, again, we worked out all these characters, like which characters are going where, um, how's the shot going to look, so that the animators don't have to do it. It's already there. It already works with the story, already works in the edit. Work out things like the, the depth of field, so who, what character's in focus, um, who, who are we wanting to focus on. Again, very important in Partisaurus Rex was how many uh, characters we needed to fill that bathtub. Um, that was a, a very big unknown. So we worked that out earlier on so that modeling knew how many characters they had to build. Um, the producers knew how much time it was going to take the animators to animate all these characters. All the work done before influences that going forward. Again, lighting. Um, don't do that in, in every short, but in this short, lighting was so important. So we worked out okay, we need these beams of light to come down at this time. We need certain elements to make the, the bathtub feel like a party. Um, so we worked that all out before. Again, basic timing. Um, animators make everything much better than, <laughs> than ours, but the timing helps them move forward. Same again, lighting, working at the environment effects, the timing here, roughly how much of the effect is going to fill up the screen. That's important as well. The effects department don't want to make this huge um, puff of smoke and find out that the framing doesn't work and it goes off screen. We kind of like work that out in advance for them. Uh, and again, basic basic um, poses just so we can, we can show what the feeling of each shot is. So Briefly, um, how I would start my, my pro process is always about preparation. Um, I'm working out how, how do I tell the story best. Obviously, with a, with a uh, short like Partisaurus Rex and then the, one, the Cars short, they're completely different films. I have to think about, okay, is this a drama? Is it a horror film? Um, what camera language best tells that story? Um, talk to the director about what, what they, they envision for the, the film. Do they see the cameras working in a certain way? Um, this is all thought out well in advance. Um, and then where's the action going to take place? Like physically, with, physically within the computer world, um, how, how, are, how are things going to be set up? How are characters going to be laid out? How are they going to travel through this environment? Very like tactile, like working that out in the computer. Um, and then what additional uh, elements do you need to research for each um, for each short? So for Partisaurus Rex, these are just images I put in here, but for example, we, Pixar Canada did a, an incredible amount of research into, okay, we need to make this bathtub feel like a rave. And how do we do that? So the amount of research <laughs> that was done into like, what the lighting looks like at, at these parties and um, what kind of movement we need. And then how do we tie that in with bubbles and a bath? Uh, how, how do we tie those two things together? So that was like a lot of research that had to be done to, cut, to get to where the final film was. Um, with uh, Radiator Springs, it was a completely different thing. It was about racing these cars through the desert. Um, so we looked at a lot of reference for that, Baja Racing. Um, but at the same time, we wanted it to feel like um, like a Western, like it was a standoff. There was good guys, bad guys racing against each other. So we wanted to have that Western feeling. Um, so we did a lot of work with the cameras about, in a, in a Western film, the cameras are really big and really heavy. So they don't whip about the way you can move cameras in, in 3D. They're super light, <laughs> don't weigh anything. 
Um, we, so we physically wanted to have cameras that felt that they were heavy and gave that overall um, feeling to the film. So um, I just want to go briefly over some some uh, little tricks that are used in animation um, to kind of guide you through the, the story. Um, I think about it as science of storytelling, as there there's um, rules that you can follow or break. There's certain kind of guidelines that will help you kind of go through. But I also think it's a, it is an art of um, storytelling. It comes with practice. It comes with watching films, dissecting films, building your own films. Over time, you get more used to, OK, what emotion am I getting from this shot? What are they doing in this shot? <laughs> Something that I always tell um, my students is that nothing in the film is an accident. And then I put almost nothing, because sometimes there are happy accidents. But uh, everything's thought out. Everything's always um, planned in advance. If you go and see a, a film at the cinema that you really like, you, you come out and you're like, oh, that was an amazing film. You know, you're talking to your friends about it. There's a reason you found that film amazing. There's so many elements that are being thought out in advance about getting you completely absorbed in that film. Um, it doesn't just happen. It's, it's an incredibly large process. Um, and a lot of these things you don't even know that are happening. Um, it's like a subconscious thing that just that guides you through this film and makes you care about the film. So I'm going to just briefly talk about... Um, uh, Pixar's Ratatouille, um, directed by uh, Brad Bird. So just some storyboards from it. Um, so the main main focus of the film is is humans and rats. Humans versus rats, not in a negative way, but in a um, two different worlds. How these two worlds come together. Um, so Linguini is our main human, and Remy is our main rat. So when we introduce. Um, Remy, one of the first times, it's in this shot here. Um, and what's interesting about this is it's showing the environment, it's you know, setting us up for where we are, the kind of feel of the film. But Remy's really small. And we're s establishing the fact that he's in the rat world. And the rat world is like very small in this huge human world. If the camera had been down at Remy's height, and Remy was like big in frame. We might not feel the same way. We might not feel his, like how daunting this huge city is to this tiny little rat. So the, again, it's those like things that happen subconsciously that start to make you, f you understand the human world and the rat world. Um, <coughs> and this still here, uh, the rats have all fallen. I think they're living in the roof and they've all fallen through the roof into this woman's house. We're introduced to this woman. The camera's sitting at her height. So we're looking down at these rats the same way she's looking down at them. We're like, oh, there's a lot of rats in her room. We start to empathize with her. Um, we're at her level looking at all these. We're made, made to feel like it's disgusting. We're like, oh, there's rats everywhere. So we're really, we're being forced to um, empathize with her in this shot. But then what happens in the... I don't know if it's the next shot, but further on, she suddenly pulls out a gun. So she's no longer this little poor, sweet old woman who ha has all these rats in her house. She's got a gun and is shooting the rats. So this camera is very much in the rat world. We are like, we are a, a rat looking down at her. The, the lens is really wide. She feels like it's scary. The, the, the barrel of the gun is shooting kind of close to camera. So we're now put in the rat's world. Um, so so the director's shifting who we're meant to be empathizing with, depending on how the shot is um, is is shot, where the camera is. If this camera had been, you know, on her shoulder, like pointing down at the gun, we might still feel like we we're kind of on her side. Um, but at this point, we're like definitely on the rat side. We're feeling that the rats are going to get shot. Um, again, here the rats are they're on a human chair, but the camera is down at their level. The rats are kind of like big in frame, so it really feels like um, 
we're we're almost humanizing the vats. We are in their world. We're understanding their environment. Um, in in this shot, the this is when Lungini is, is releasing Remy for the first time after the first time he catches him. And what's interesting is the camera's really low in frame, so we're down with uh, we're down with Remy, so we're in Remy's um, world. And in Linguini, the human is down as well. He's like he's like embracing this rat world. So he's he's physically down on the floor as well. And another um, trick that they've done here, which again is not a, definitely not an accident, is the walls are pointing directly at the rat. So our, the viewer's eye looks exactly where it's meant to be looking. And these are all little tricks that are done throughout. Um, throughout feature films, throughout any any film, to really guide the audience through the story and make them feel a certain way. Once Remy started to um, kind of be more, not human-like, but accepted into the human world, we start seeing shots like this, which is um, him, uh, Remy and Linguini are kind of on par now. They're at the same eye level. The camera's kind of framing them both equally. Um, which is a shift from the start. And it's not something you would notice the first time you watch this film. It's not, it's not something I would notice. I wouldn't watch this film and be like, oh, I see what they're doing. They're changing the cameras. It's just something that if you were to study the film that you might start picking up on. And these are the things that come with experience. Um, these artists have spent a long time kind of like working this stuff out and thinking all the, all the tricks of how they might tell their story better. Again, at this point, um, the rats are all invading the kitchen. It's near the end of the film. Um, <coughs> this camera's interesting because it's, um, it's not low enough to be the rat's level, and it's not high enough to be the human's level. So this, this camera's actually um, from the kind of the bad guy in the film, uh, Skinner, I think his name is. Um, so he's kind of like not in the rat's world and not in the human's world. It's this like halfway so that's why this camera is at that level, which is quite interesting because it's always like an extreme of rat and human. And at that point, it's like he's he's somewhere in be between. He doesn't belong to either world. Uh, and then near the end, um, when uh, Linguini is showing, uh, is basically introducing uh, Remy to the other the chefs, we they use this camera, which is. S very low we're seeing um the we're, we're viewing from a rat's level but the rat in the image has been elevated to the human level um Linguini's holding him up at the height of the human level um so this is really where the worlds kind of come together and he, he's accepted um so very quickly i'm going to go over a few more examples just from wally um by andrew stanton so <laughs> We fall in love with Wally very quickly in this film. Um, hopefully, everybody's seen this film. Um, he's a very adorable character, and we really feel for him very, very early on in this film. Um, the kind of key to that is um, believability. Um, we believe where he is. We believe that he exists. Obviously, we know it's, it's made up, but at the time when you're watching this film, everything feels real. Um, his environment feels real. Um, he's an amazing model. The textures, the lighting, everything about it feels like they've actually they've, they've really thought about how they're going to build this. Um, Jeremy Lasky, who was the um, uh, director of photography, basically the head layout artist on this film, said um, the camera should feel like you actually went there and shot it. So that was very important throughout this film, um, that the camera would adjust for little micro movements. It would, should feel like there was a physical camera in this world, that it's not just in the computer, it was very tactile. There was, um, the lighting should shift. Um, the focus should change depending what we should be looking at. There's little like incidental things happening in the frame. Um, and all this does is really emphasize how um, how 
how we should feel about this character, how um, the more believable he is in this environment, environment, the more we feel for him. Um, but that wasn't an accident. They spent a long time working this out. They got outside uh, director of photography to come in with cameras. They built um, models of these, these characters to work out how the lenses should work, uh, how the lighting should work. Um, to really build this environment and pull it all together so that these intimate moments really feel special and they feel um, very real. Um, they don't feel CG at all. There's a lot of texture to them. Um, and that all of this was worked out very early on. Um, so that really the camera, the camera helps um, us to believe he actually exists. And the more we believe he actually exists, the more we'll care. If we just think, oh, he's a, he's some like computer generated thing that's stuck in a computer somewhere and they're just showing the shots, we wouldn't care about him. But because we believe he's in this environment alone, there's this camera following him about, you know, we really care about him, which is like, is what makes this film so great. Um, so just to summarize, hopefully that gave you a little bit of the, the tricks that, the, that are used. Um, my, I, I always describe his layout as um, storytelling through cinematography. It's really about um, how can I tell this story through camera? What is the camera doing to be able to tell me, to tell me this story better? Um, so again, some, some things that I like look at is how can I tell the story in a clear and meaningful way? If the audience isn't um, following the story, we're doing something wrong. If you go watch a film and halfway through you're like, or maybe not even halfway through, 10 minutes through, you're like, I'm just not, I don't care about this film, I don't care about the camera uh, character, I don't care about the story. Um, there's something wrong. So that's really important about, okay, we need to make this story important, important to the viewer. Um, what camera techniques we use um, to again enhance, enhance the story, guide the viewer through that story. Um, and that's so important with emotions as well. The camera really emphasizes emotions, um, where you place the camera, how the camera moves. If it's a scary film, the ca camera's really static, that doesn't help. If it's a scary film, the camera's like following the action and like shaking and making us feel a certain way, that enhances that story. Um, and it, it works the opposite way with, with emotion. If the camera's uh, moving about all over the place and we can't read that uh, character or actor either, um, space and what, what they're doing, that distracts from the emotion that we're meant to be feeling. So it's, it's, re it's really an important thing that you should never be aware of when you're watching a film. <laughs> I always say like you should it should just be a subconscious thing. What I normally do is I watch films with and try not think of all these techniques. I just watch them um, and just try and get absorbed in them. And then if I I'm, if I'm like do you know what I really enjoyed that film, like what what made that film really good, I'll go back and watch it again often with the sound off, just so I can look at the cameras and, and kind of identify what they're doing. So just to, just to sum up there, whether you're an animator, modeler, visual effects, compositor, layout artist, um, what is always important, it doesn't matter of like how beautiful the lighting is or how beautiful the modeling is, if the story isn't being told, you'll lose your audience. So the audience is always always has to be engaged with the story. A beautiful image, you know, Pixar and many other studios make beautiful, beautiful films. But what really makes those films successful is that the story is told in the best way it can. You'd absorbed in that story, you always know how you should be feeling, and that's really what makes a successful film. So on that note, I'm going to finish up and we're going to switch to some uh,
question and answer from Sizzler. Oh, oh, thank you so much, Dan. That was no amazing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have an exclusive 15-minute Q&A with Sizzler. And then after that, we're going to open it up to the wider audience for some online questions that might be coming through. Okay, so Sizzler, when you're ready. Sizzler. Hello. Oh, no, sorry, we can't hear you. Two sets. One second, we're just trying to... Their mic is muted. We think your mic is muted, Sizzler, maybe. Bear with us two minutes. Now you know everybody watching knows it's live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we maybe start with one of our live feed questions? Yeah, cool. Okay, Jen. So can you tell me what was the hardest project you've ever worked on? Oh, um, there's been a lot of hard projects. Each, each project, I think, has its its own challenges um, for various reasons. I mean, it can be a hard project just because you don't have enough time to do mm -hmm. your project, um, or a hard project because your director is very, very specific about what they want um, and what in getting that is, is, is like a hard thing to do. To do. Um, personally, I would probably say my one of my hardest projects was um, a, a, a in-game uh, cinematography sequence that I did on my first job mm -hmm. um, and the reason it was hard was wasn't like if I went back and did it now I probably wouldn't find it hard um, but it was my first job and I just uh, was terrified I didn't know what I was doing um, the the other artists and directors were using all these this terminology that I didn't know what it was <laughs> they were saying words and I was like <laughs> talking about and and being new I didn't want to be the one to be like I don't know what I don't know what <laughs> what you're talking about I don't know what you're saying um so that was like a I would say that was like my first couple of projects on my first job personally would be my hardest just mm -hmm. because it was such a big learning curve um and I think when you're new in the industry it's really hard to speak up and and say hey I don't know what you're talking yeah. <laughs> or I don't know what I'm doing is a really hard thing to say. Yeah. I think with experience, you actually get, it's kind of like with experience, you don't suddenly know what you're doing. You mm -hmm. just have the more more of a confidence to be able to say, I, I, I need, need help. help. Yeah, absolutely. exactly. <laughs> so I would say, yeah, kind of like all the jobs, all, all of the projects in my first job were probably the hardest cool. thing that I had to deal with. Okay, cool. Well, I think we have Sisla back with us now. So we're going to take a question from Sisla. Sorry. Hi. Hi, I'm Mary, and my question is, what important skills does it take to be a laid out, layout artist? Okay, thanks Mary. So, um, your school, um, thank your, um, skills does it take to be a layout artist? Um, I would say, uh, I mean, I kind of fell into layout art, to be a layout artist um, kind of by accident. As I said, my first job was advertising as a layout artist but it wasn't really uh wasn't really um explained to me they didn't really know what a layout artist was um it it kind of came together because i'd done my photography degree as well so it's really about um being able to as well as being able to like compose shots like arrange things in appealing ways and in, in, in ways that make sense it's about taking all the shots round about and telling your story i always say it's about it's, it's storytelling like i i i pretty much always refer to myself as a storyteller i'll say yeah i work in cinematography and 3d but it's really about storytelling so for skills to get into layout um really it's like an ability to be able to understand the story 
and how to look at the bigger picture. It's not just about a little, it's not about this one shot, it's about the whole film. How do I make the whole film work? How do I make the whole film good? And also, um, every department has this issue, but layout in particular has this issue, which is you never get it on your first try. It's always like we have to do five iterations of the, the sequence to get it to work. So it's about like it's about almost about perseverance. It's a kind of journey to be able to get to that final film um, and not be satisfied with your first attempt at something because um, you're always going to be working with the director and with the editor um, to change your shots, to be like, do you know what, this is good, um, but it's not as good as it could be. So it's always about pushing those boundaries and kind of accepting the fact that you're going to have to do something 10 times until you get it right. But when you get it right, that means all the other departments have great shots to work with. They're working on a, a solid story. So hopefully that answered your question, Mary. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Jim. Cool. Do you have anything else from Sisla? Hi, my name's Kaylee. I was just wondering if there's any exercises that you would like to, or that um, you do to help yourself warm up, like uh, watching a movie and sketching thumbnails of some of your favorite compositions or anything like that. Um, so there is my kind of... Uh, approach when I'm, I'm starting a film for the first time is l looking at films that not that necessarily you want to replicate but um, that have the same feel of the film that you want to create. Um, I tend to watch a lot of reference. Um, you know for for RS500 the, the Cars short we, I watched Good, the Bad and the Ugly I don't know how many times because I wanted to find a, a film that had that Western feel to it. Um, I, a thing that I do, which I mentioned earlier, is I watch these films without any audio, um, which actually I suggest if anybody's like going into cinematography or editing in particular, is interested in that kind of, of thing, watching a film without, a, without audio is kind of... Um, an odd thing to do, but it actually like brings like your attention to what the camera is doing, what the lighting looks like, how it's cutting together. Um, so that's really how I kind of warm up. I do take sketches of things to your point of 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 things that I like. How I I'm not that great a drawer to be honest. So <laughs> I take a lot of screen grabs. <laughs> um, I'm like screen grab queen. Um, so I take screen grabs all the time of, of films that I like, even if it's a film that I don't, I'm not necessarily going to use for a particu particular project. Just having, if there's something that I really in enjoy in a film, I'll take screen grabs of it and think, oh, maybe, uh, maybe we'll include that later. Um, coming up with shots with no reference is a really hard thing to do. So the more kind of like informed you can be um, and you have a big bank of uh, shots in your mind that you've, that you've researched before really helps. So hopefully that answers how I warm up, <laughs> which is I continually warm up <laughs> by watching lots of films. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm JP Bass Bass. Uh, so what happens to projects that are worked on for a good while, but they're cancelled midway or they're cancelled near lease? Are they recycled for any other projects, or is there like some other fate that awaits them? Thank you. Uh, okay, maybe Sarah can ha jump in halfway through this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's been various projects that I've worked on that um, have been have been pulled halfway through or near very near the end, um, and although that can be a very kind of uh, painful process. For everybody involved and, and for artists, you know, to, to have their work um, not completed and not be able to show your friends and family and it's kind of a hard thing to do. Um, I think there is a kind of learning thing that happens. Um, the way I kind of look at it is you learn so much on a project. Nobody goes into a project and thinks, oh, I know everything. You, you start a project and it's kind of like that fear of your first job again, it's kind of like, oh, I've got this huge project to complete, 
oh, how are we going to do it? Um, you're learning every time and you get so far and even if it's not completed, you've learned a lot. Um, you know, there's certain aspects, ne not necessarily that the actual film will develop into something else or ever really get used, but I feel like the artists have learned a lot through that film and I think that's really when you're in that kind of situation of, of not being able to finish a film, um, you have to kind of look at, uh, at what you've learned and look at that as the as the benefit of that time that's been spent. I mm -hmm. don't know if you kind of agree with that or... Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, it is really a learning curve. And the one thing that makes being a student unique is that most of the things that you work on when you're developing your own project is that it's your own and you get to have those ideas and those... Uh, those creative thought processes. Um, but when you work in the industry, it belongs to somebody else. So you need to you need to love what you do. Of course you do. You need to be like passionate about your craft. But at the same time, realize that there may be a time when you have to let it go and it doesn't get completed. Sometimes projects do get um, reinvented. Yep. They come back, come back from the grave. Other times, that's it. They do. They get put on hold. They get cut. And you'll never see that work again, which is... It's hard to deal with, as Jen said, but yeah, you do learn so much from it. And always, it's it's a it's a fun. Well, the projects that we've worked on together have been a fun a fun journey, anyway. So, yeah, and I would also say that um, what one thing is to kind of this isn't always the case, but in in a lot of cases, if projects have been pulled, it's normally ninety five percent of the time for a good reason. Um, that maybe it's not the film's not working out, the story's not there, you know. It's it's a decision of oh, uh, if we finish this film and we put it out there, it might not be as good as we wanted it to be. So there's sometimes like hard but yeah, like positive reasons for it as well. Hopefully that that answers. Is there cool? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, hello, my name is uh, James, and I would just like to ask, like, how is it like working on movies like Toy Story and um, and working for Pixar? Like, how is like the environment in there? Like, do you feel any pressure at all when you're like working in the studio or industry? Um. So when I first started at Pixar Canada, I was like terrified. Like that day, first day, and you show up. Especially somewhere like Pixar, you're like, oh God, this is awful. I don't yeah. know how, why am I here? <laughs> Who's let me in this door? It's basically like, it's a hard thing to um, get get your head around. If it's if it's a, it's a job that you really, really wanted to, do, to have or, or a studio you really wanted to be in for a long time, it's kind of a pretty intimidating thing. Kind of doesn't matter how much experience you have. That like first day when you walk in the door and you're like, God, I'm at Pixar. People are like serious here and they're very good and I don't know how I'm gonna live up to that. It's uh it's a very scary thing. But m my experience and I'm pretty sure Sarah's experience too with, with like Pixar is um and most other studios and I think every studio I've been in, is people are very welcoming and very um accepting that you know you, there is a learning curve even if yeah even if you're um incredibly experienced every studio is different every studio has a different process a different pipeline a different way of working so mm -hmm. you're always going to be that new person who needs the help who needs to ask people questions who needs to you know like go over certain certain things because you're just like i don't know what i'm doing but Especially as a junior, when you go into a studio, I find that the more you can be like, hey, I need help, I'm a junior, like, and be okay with that, the more the more help people will give you. Everybody has been the new person. Everyone's been, like, the new person in the industry. So I find people um, in the animation and visual effects industry very, very welcoming to, yeah. to newcomers and, and really, like, help help you out. Obviously, you, you can't help but be intimidating. It's certain, you know. I remember the first time I opened the computer up and I had, uh, was doing like a sequence at Pixar and yeah, Toy Story characters, and I was like, I was like, oh, 
with these on my screen. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> I, it was quite a quite a thing to live up to. Um, but it, d- it does take time to like have that confidence to go, okay, they let me in the door here, yeah. so I, I must be okay. So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think as well, I mean, uh, Pixar was a studio that I'd always wanted to work at. And even after 13 years of working in industry, it was still, yeah, intimidating would be the right yeah. word. But it was so much fun. It was so, and it's funny, I was going to like say exactly what Jen said the first time I opened up my Maya file. And there was the model of Woody on my screen. It was kind of like a pinch me moment. Like, yeah. Am I really here? <laughs> um, but with it does come, obviously, pressure and challenges, and you want to kind of live up to that. But I think everybody uh, pulls together as a team in a studio, so it's not you don't have to bear the brunt of everything. You're always kind of working with everyone else around you to make sure you hit those targets yeah. and get the big final approval. So, yeah, fun times. Oh, I think we're just so we're losing a little bit of speed. One second for just being live again for a moment. Hi, I'm Janelle, and I'm going to be studying at the US for uh, 3D animation and special effects mm-hmm. in 2017. I am Marcy, I'm starting at the US next year. Yeah, we might. Yeah, I think we're just going to go back to our live feed. Um, so quickly, I have a question from Sienna, who's, uh, who's joining us from London. So she'd like to know, um, what would be your top movie? If she was going to study a film to get into layout, what would that be? Ooh, that's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are so many good films. Um, s- a specific animation film that I would say would be my top in general for like every trick that that's been done and would actually be Toy Story 3. Um, it is, um, it's the most, apart from maybe Wally, the start of Wally in particular, um, it's the most un-CG feeling uh, 3D film I've seen. So what I mean, it, mean by that is um, it's, it doesn't feel like it's been made by a computer. Um, it feels like, you know, there's there's a little tiny cameraman that's like following these toys about, and every time the toy kind of like moves over, the camera moves over with it. It's the camera's always moving. Um, so again, I've watched that film quite a lot without the audio on it. <laughs> Um, and again, it's a really great, even if you take, do five minutes of it, you don't need to watch the whole film without the audio. But if you take five minutes of that film, turn the audio off, and just analyze each camera move, or each camera, each shot, there's hardly any cameras that are completely static, i.e. we've just placed the camera in 3D space and just not touched it, just had the animation. But the camera's always like a readjusting to, to the characters and, um, that all again helps the same as what Wally. It all helps with them um, believability. Uh, we believe these toys are real. We believe um, that there is a camera physically there filming them, and uh, that's what helps really push that story along. Overall, apart from all these these, these tiny little details, the the layout on that film is incredibly good. There's no shot that shouldn't be in that film. Each shot tells a particular part of the story, helps move the story on. Um, so that that would be, to answer the question, I think that would be my number one. If I had to watch one film, or if a new layout artist was coming in, they only had the ability to watch one film, that would probably be the one I would say. Um, but in general, I would just say, watch as many films as possible. Because I think that's the best um, best reference for for becoming a layout artist is just getting used to film language and, and what. Right. Yep. Thank you. No problem. We have system back. Yes, we have system back. Yes, we have system back. Hi. Right. Right. Hi, I'm Janelle, and I'll be studying at um, Sisler, no, like VFS 
uh, for 3D animation and special effects next year. Hi, I'm Marcia. I'm taking uh, film production at VFS next year. I'm Kevin, and I'm also taking film production next year. Hi, I'm Ritwik, and I'm also taking film production next year. And our question was that, what role does a mentor play for a VFS student? Uh, for a, yeah, for a VFS student. Sorry, could you repeat that for us? Could you repeat your question? I think I think I heard the oh, question. Okay. Um, so I think the question was, if I'm not wrong, um, was what what does a mentor? What's a mentor's role at, at VFS? Oh, cool. Okay. So a mentor is basically somebody who has real life industry experience and they will come in on a weekly basis and are paired with one student and they help to guide them through the technical and creative issues that they have on their project, giving them ideas about how would they approach a, a problem that they encounter maybe in the studio that very day, like how should you, how should you solve that problem. It gives you an opportunity to, to learn, like exactly what's going on at that moment in time in the industry, um, as well as make some all important connections and realize that the artists that are working with you, that will be working with you when you, when you go into the workplace, um, are not so scary. We're just people mm -hmm. who, who started out as, as students as well at one point. Yeah, I, mean, I think my experience of, of mentoring as well is there's such great, um, like full-time uh, instructors at, at the film school that you know that you'll spend a lot of time with um, and learn a lot from but having um, this outside voice who's basically like we're kind of like we almost like back up everything that's been mm -hmm. said they're like oh yeah oh yeah my day mentor said that as well it's like yeah they're, they're not lying to you this this yeah. is like what what they're it's kind of like a, I find that sometimes it is like a reassurance that you know, hearing a, an external voice saying that's it, you're you're learning exactly the right things. You're learning yeah. exactly what you need um, to be able to go into industry. Like that, I've been in the exact same same position. Um, is is often like a pretty helpful thing yeah, uh, for for the day day mentors as as, as well. Just to to ha just have this external kind of like we are we are mentors in the f film school but we also work outside the film school and yeah. and uh, we know exactly what's going on in the industry so. i think the one thing um that i really love about the mentors daytime and and the industry mentors that come in the evening is basically the love of what they do so when you take people who have spent the whole day working in the studio on projects and they then want to come into the school and work with students and pass on their knowledge um it's quite a unique, a unique thing yeah. to have here at the school, and we're always really, really proud of how supportive of that you know they are. So that's quite a quite an amazing yeah. thing. And I have another question. Yeah. So, so, how do you where where's the line between being attached to a project and being too attached to a project, and how do you know if you cross it or not? <laughs> You want to go? Okay, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if there's an actual line <laughs> where that happens. Um, especially as a student, it's really, really hard not to get too attached to your project because it's like, it's yours. It's yours from the beginning to the end. It's like a project that you're going to use to hopefully get out there and, and, and get into the industry. You know, it's... It's a huge deal when you're a student uh, with projects. Um, I always just think it's it's a really hard thing to get so far with a project and then think, oh, this just isn't working. I need to I need to start again or I need to rethink the whole thing. Um, so my advice is always um, just as hard as it is, just to step back from it and think, okay. If I was watching this as somebody who knew nothing about about this film, what would I think of it? What, how would I react? It's a very hard thing to do because it's like it's kind of like self-criticizing or mm -hmm. self-analyzing, but you're looking at your own work and thinking, okay, I know I spent a really long time on this one shot. Like I know I spent a week animating this shot, but when I look at the um, 
the film overall does this does this shot work and it's a really hard thing to say you know what this shot doesn't work i'm going to take it out and mm -hmm. i've just lost a week's work that's a really hard thing to do but um i, I don't know if i'm going to be able to answer this question about how you know um but i think it's being able to like step away from the project and and uh look at it with fresh eyes which is also actually mm -hmm. back to the previous question is what i actually think is pretty good about um industry mentors here um because i get the opportunity to see students projects when they're at a certain stage but i have no prior history with the student or prior knowledge of their projects i get to see their projects from this like fresh and and i look at them and kind of with fresh eyes and i I get them not to tell me about their projects as well. I just watch it. And then being able to be a bit distant and say, OK, your project's working really well, but there's a few areas we need to change. Or, you know, I, I understood it up to a certain point, then I got lost here. And then I can like help that that shouldn't go, OK, why Why did I get lost? Why? What happened here that caused me to get lost in the story? Um, so often the industry mentors can be this it's kind of like allowing students not to be too attached because mm -hmm. it's it's a fresh set of eyes it's like okay once this is finished how's this how's a new person looking at this project going to going to take it so I, i'm probably not going to be able to answer that question but <laughs> that's um, basically what i would say yeah and i'm just going to add one thing it's um it's learning and it's a real skill to learn, but it's learning how to kind of listen to like the mentors and those around you who've been there before and just try it. So somebody might have a suggestion um, that they think might improve your project, but you're really, you're really set on doing it one way. If you just try it, it might not work, but then again, it might. Um, so it's all about just giving it a go and, and learning to listen to other people's suggestions. And if at the end of the day you think your idea was better, then fine, go back to it while you're still a student. <laughs> Obviously, when you're in the industry, you're going to need to uh, just do what you're told. <laughs> oh, thank you. And from everyone, uh, from everyone at Sisler, thanks a lot for connecting with us and thanks a lot for giving us such good advices. Oh, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. We've got a couple of time for a couple more questions. So this is Matthew in Toronto, and he asks, "What do you do for fun?" Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not look at a computer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I do for fun? Um, <laughs> sadly, I kind of watch movies <laughs> for fun. Me um, too. You know, uh, I do try and find. Uh, um, I find uh, with when you're working in. Um, computer animation and, uh, and visual effects, you spend a lot of time on the computer. So I try and spend time away from the computer mm -hmm, yeah. quite a lot. Um, uh, I actually I, I enjoy a lot of drawing, um, which isn't directly related to, to my job, but I, I draw because I, I find it pretty therapeutic. But I have to say still, like, if I've got an evening off, my choice is to watch movies <laughs> uh, or binge watch something on Netflix generally. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, which again is like, doesn't make me feel bad because I feel like it's research. So it's Absolutely. fine when I've like sat in front of the TV for, for hours. But um, I do, I, I'm aware of it because of the amount of time I sit in front of a computer that I'm like, oh, I'm just watching another screen. But that's my honest answer is I watch more movies. <laughs> Well, that's why you do what you do, yeah. Jeff. Um, and I think just one more question. We have Jamie in Vancouver who asks, if he wanted to uh, become a layout artist, what kind of stuff would you want to see in a portfolio or a demo reel if he was going to create? And what do you look for in a good layout artist? Um, back to story. Uh, I, you know, when I've been lead or, or helping recruit for for positions um i've looked like a look looked at a lot of reels and what i tend to my like number one is always do i understand the story here there's 
there's jobs, and particularly in visual effects, that really involve like big camera moves, like beautiful camera moves, um, which is a is a is a, an amazing skill to have. But um, for most of the the shows that I've worked on, what we're really looking for is someone who can tell a story. So I'll look at a reel, and um, you know, they might have a sequence of shots, and I'll ask myself. Did I understand that? It's kind of the same as what I do with with a student's project as well. Like I, n I don't know what's happened. Nobody's told me in advance what's happening in this in your reel. Um, but I'll look at what. Am I able to understand the story? Like yeah, the cameras, the composition might not be a hundred percent, especially if it's a if it's a new artist. You know that can come can come with experience. People can like guide you and say, oh, if you rearrange this um, this composition, it might look better, or, um, you know, if you, there's always, like, tips that we can give, and I'm, I, like, I'm not looking for something that's 100% by any means, um, but I'm looking for somebody who can, can understand story, understands what that role is, um, and I think back a lot to when, when I was applying to layout jobs, the jobs that were actually looking for layout artists. Um, and I just showed them my student reel. And I look at it now, and I kind of, I understand why they thought I could do it. <laughs> and that was because my student reel had a lot of, a lot of cameras, but they were for a purpose. And I had done that subconsciously. I had done that, um, I think because I came from a photography background, and I kind of understood how how to kind of tell a story um so that would be that was always my number one like to be able to show that you can do like simple blocking and um you know that like simple modeling as well is is really good like layout artists tend to be very they multitask a lot like a lot of the times in projects you know the modeling team we were working at the same time as them, and we were like, oh, I need a tree. Modeling haven't built us a tree yet. I need a tree. And I'm like, okay, I'll quickly build a tree. Uh, and when I say a tree, it'll be like a triangle with a stick coming out the bottom of it. <laughs> but, you know, just focusing on, okay, I need a tree for my story and not getting hung up on what my tree looks like. I'll just, like, build it quickly. So that kind of, like, scrappiness as well of, like, we need to get this made and we need to... Um, we need to tell the story without getting hung up on the details. Um, so it's good to be able to show multiple things as well. Like if I have two ar artists and one of them can model a little bit as well, that's that's great. Um, but it's not the, the key thing I looked at. It's always, it's always about the story. So that would be like, if I was looking at a reel, I would be looking for camera work, for sequences, always those sequences of, of shots and, and, and telling those stories. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Jen Rackley, for joining thank us today. That pleasure. was a wonderful talk. And thank you to Sisla and all our other schools that were tuning in today and our wider live audience. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>